Hi, it's Alex from Bad Dreams. Hey, Michaela Jenke here. Hey there, this is Don Ross. It's Cam from Pump Over Here. Hi, it's Jacob here. Hey, this is George Harris from The Raven Age. Hey, it's Tom from Lost Woods. Hi, this is New Regulars. Hey, this is Fletcher Pillen, and you're listening to The Gig with Hannah. So I'm joined by Russell Morris. Welcome to Adelaide. Absolutely cute it out on stage. How did it feel? It was cold, Hannah. I tell you what, my fingers really didn't work yeah. too well, but it was good. It's very hard always opening up for big American acts yeah. because what they do is the crowd is just coming in but also the American acts don't allow you to use the PA to its full extent mm -hmm. so you're stuck on something like 98 dB which is like shouting volume yeah. when they come on it's way way over that so you tend to sound a little bit a little bit trickly a little bit of a stream against a raging river so it is hard, but I, uh, we love getting up there and the crowd seemed to appreciate it, which was great. Well, you've got your Aussie fans here. They don't have their American fans here, so you've got one above yeah. them on that. Yeah. So, last five years, you've been super busy with the release of three albums. You've really stuck to, like, the true Australian story and you've touched a lot of hearts through your music. What about these three albums do you feel has been the reason for their success? I think uh, the reason for their success because it had been a long time. I'd had about five albums and they all sunk without a trace. Mm. And I think what happens if you've been around for a while and you write in a particular way, you always tend to fall back on that pattern of writing. Mm. And what happens, and you may be writing better songs than you did when you first started, but it's still the same style. Yeah. And people become sick of you. And people, they go, oh yeah, I like it, but I really like his old stuff better. And they just get sort of used to it and then you, they pigeonhole you and they say, right, this is his style, I know what he does, I, and that's that sort of style. And a new album comes out and they go, well, I've got his old albums. So what I came out, I sort of came out with a wet fish and slapped them across the face. I did something that no one in Australia expected me to do because mm. no one really knew that I started doing the blues. That was what mm. I first started playing. And then Ian Meldrum came along and said, we need to be more commercial. And that's how that started. I was doing Tamla Motown and blues stuff. And um, that's what happened. And I was doing, writing the blues songs. And then I saw a photo of Thomas Archer, who is on the front of the first cover, Shark Mouth. And I thought, what a great photo. And it just communicated to me. It said, if you're going to write blues and root songs, you can't write about New Orleans or Mississippi. You never lived there. You don't understand it. You don't understand that culture. Mm. Write about your own culture and do it in a blues genre and it virtually said write a song about me let mm. people know I lived and breathed and I scared the hell out of everybody so I wrote the song about Thomas Archer and called it Shark Mouth and that was his nickname and I that was it it opened the door for me and I realized then that's what I should do I've, I've been blind and I that went down and fortunately everyone else thought the same thing I thought wow this is because when we first did the album not one record company wanted to touch it because of my really? past reputation because they thought oh yeah we've heard you know blah, oh and he's doing so that's not going to work and finally one record company took it yeah and it just went off like a firecracker it was the biggest selling album of no, uh, 2013 I know. Yeah. so you've chosen to work really closely with Mitch Cairns why was that like in your band and like producer well he's very good he's, he's very he good and he's, he's the sort of guy that I can um, say to him listen Mitch I what I hear on this track I hear an elephant walking on the, the dirt. Do you think yeah. you could go to the zoo and tape the sound of an elephant walking on dirt and we'll double it up? And we'll, yeah. Not that ridiculous, of yeah. course, but I can suggest ridiculous ideas. Mm. And he would go, yeah, so. all right, let's give it a go. I don't know if it'll work, but we'll try it. <laughs> Other producers would go, are you serious? Mm. That's, that's never going to work. So what they do is they pour cold water on your ideas. You really need someone who's a bit open and conducive to ideas. That's what music's about though, isn't it? That's right, yeah, but there are a lot of people who work the formulas and work to what should be done, yeah. So let's go back to 2008, inducted into the ARIA Hall of Fame. How, where were you when you found out this news? Uh, I, they rang me when I was in Melbourne and they said, will you come up to the ARIAs and uh, you're going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I'll do it. and then they... Were you shocked having... or did you like, have any idea this was going to happen? No, no, I didn't. No, I, I thought maybe eventually, because mm. I'd had the hits and things, and they ended up having it in Melbourne. The uh, only funny thing about the night, Rolf Harris was inducted at the same time. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but when I got inducted, I thought, you know what I feel like? I feel like I'm working for AMP, mm. and they've brought me up before the board and given me a gold watch and said... <laughs> 
great job done. Now it's all over for you. You just go off now. Oh. You've done your, you've made your contribution. You just go away and disappear. I felt a little bit like that, mm. and that was when I decided to do the new album. So mm. I thought, damn it, I've still got more stuff to do. You know? Yeah. So lots of like rock artists and people that have really made history in the music industry, when they first started off, they had no idea how long their fame was going to last. Like it was all new for everyone. Was this the same for you, just taking it day by day? Well, I said to my folks, I, I was doing a diploma, <clears throat> and I said, I'm going to leave my third year. Oh. And they said, yes. What was serious? your diploma in? Accountancy and economics. And they said, you can't do this. Yeah. And I said, I want to do the music. And they said, okay, it's your decision. We'll stand by it, whatever you want to do. And I said, listen, by the time I'm 25, I'll be too old to be in the music business. Mm. Mm. I'll go back and finish my final year. Yeah. And I said, uh, <laughs> I've dropped two subjects in second year. I'll just do them and a couple of subjects, and then I'll do another extra year and complete it. And I'll, mm -hmm. But I'll do that after I've had a little bit of a dabble in the music. Yeah. <laughs> the devil is still continuing. It sure is. So you were making music history at the same time Molly Meldrum was in the scene. Molly's had such a heavy influence on a lot of Australian artists. How did he change your path? He changed my path. He is, he's got an incredible knack and an incredible, incredible ability to hear something when it's right, when he knows it's going to touch the public. And like you can be sitting in the studio for days with him trying to get a guitar part and some get poor guitar players going through the ropes and playing and playing and then Molly all of a sudden will go stop that's it when everyone else has nearly fallen asleep yeah and he just seems to instinctively know what's right yeah and he was a, a great record producer but laborious he took forever to do things mm. the real thing took no time at all to record it took forever for him to mix it yeah he mixed it remixed it mixed it remixed it mixed it it went on forever yeah. But he was right, and he, he had the idea to make it from a three-and-a-half-minute song to a six-and-a-half-minute song, and that was an accident because the drummer was... What they were playing, they got to the end, and the engineer went to push the button, the talkback button, and say, OK, guys, we've got it. And Ian said, no, let him play. Yeah. And then the drummer did a fill and went into double time. They played and played, and then the drummer threw his sticks down. Yeah. We went, oh, and Ian said, don't worry, we'll fade it. Mm. Then later that night he rang me up, and he said, I've got a great idea. <laughs> I said, what? He said, we're going to make the record six-and-a-half minutes. I said, are you serious? I said, no one will play it. And he said, well, we'll make it like an EP with a little mark in the middle. Mm -hmm. And when it gets there, the DJs can fade it if they want to play the whole thing. I said, but what do we do the last three minutes? Mm -hmm. There's just the band jamming. He said, I'll put sound effects. And I said, Ian, I don't see this is going to work. He said, trust me, it's going to work. And he was right. Yeah, that's insane. So everyone's yeah. got their crazy Molly story. What's yeah. yours? Uh... When uh, the people wanted to, EMI was so annoyed that he'd spent so much money on the single, wanted to mm -hmm. come down and hear it. And he, uh, he said, I don't want them to come and hear it. And they said, we have to come and we, we've paid for this. And I said, Ian, they'll love it. Don't worry, they're going to love this song. And he was terrified. And the engineers saying to him, they're going to love it. He said, no, they're going to hate it. They're going to hate it. So he started to get drunk. Before they got there, he took the tapes and ran out onto the golf course. And um, we had to go and get him and bring him back play them the song that we're sitting there and it finishes. He was right. They hated it. They thought it was the biggest load of rubbish. They went back to Sydney and they rang up and said, we hate it. We don't think it's ever going to do anything. We might release it in Melbourne, but that's about it. We're not going to release it Australia-wide. So Ian said, if you don't, I'm going to burn the tapes. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so they decided to do it, yeah. And the rest is history. Now, yeah. look, your music career started mid-60s, yeah? Yeah. And like, it's what you've been doing ever since. Finally, I just want to know why personally you've stuck with music through the highs and through the lows. You've just kept doing it. I, I sort of I failed at brain surgery and it was really hard to get back into getting a job. Yeah. I've never been, yeah, I've never been qualified to do anything. If I did something else, I would have had to have gone back mm. and probably finished my diploma and been an accountant or an, ec an economist or something like that. And... Every now and then I'd go through really bad years of no work mm. and then it would turn around just briefly yeah. and it, then it would go flat again. Then it would turn around, then it would turn around and then from 1993 I think it really picked up. Mm. And then it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until Sharkmouth which is the biggest thing I've ever had even over the real thing and all that. It's the biggest selling not a lot of people realise that. They all think, oh, the real thing's the biggest thing I've ever had. 
especially older people because that's mm. all they remember. Mm. But uh, the new stuff, um, those two albums have got arias and one was the biggest selling album of 2013, so it's been good. It's all about the passion and sticking with it. <laughs> sticking, that's with anything. Absolutely. It's anything, yeah. If you stick with the passion, that's it. All right, thank you so much, Russell Morris. Have Thanks a good night. So <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Dale.